welcome everybody to the Magic Beans podcast. We are back again for episode number 111. That's 111. I'm your host tonight, and my name is Shorty, and I've got a couple of beans on the line with me again. So tonight we have Chewy. How's it going, mate? Very well, thank you. That's the way. And we've also got Cracker. How's it going? Well, I'm back on the show, so we know what that means. <laughs> I mean, you are on the show last week. So. That's true. That's true. No, I'm good, man. Very well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so lots of things to talk about tonight. Uh, yeah, as Cracker alluded, he is on here for a very specific reason, as I'm sure if you're vaguely uh, keeping in touch with what's going on in the magic world, you would know that we had some nice big uh, ban announcements. Or, well, I mean, the, well, the ban announcement was fairly big, but a whole bunch of other stuff that sort of came along with that. So we will definitely be getting into that tonight, as well as we're planning on Looking at the historic format, we've got our one-day historic event coming up next weekend to kick off the uh, the Magic Beans tournament series for 2022. So we're going to have a bit of a look at where the historic format's at and what's going on there. But before we get into any of that, Chewy, do you want to tell us about Josh and Pat's MTG Bazaar? Oh, yes, I would like to tell you about our amazing sponsors, Josh and Pat's MTG Bazaar. They are a Facebook auction group where you can bid on their nightly lots of physical magic cards, premium auctions on the weekend. You can get some fancy pants tokens for winning. They sponsor the Magic Beans and our tournament series, of which our upcoming historic event is the first event for this year. So stoked to have Josh and Pat's back in our corner for this year. And when you do jump on via jpmtgbazaar.com.au, give them a like, win an auction, Tell them that the beans sent you. Very good. All right. So, yeah, we do have a lot to get into tonight, so we're, we're just going to sort of jump straight into it. So, Cracker, banned and yeah. restricted announcement. We sort of knew something was coming. I mean, well, actually, before we get into that, one thing we didn't talk about was the pauper uh, banning announcement, which we haven't actually got on our docket tonight, but a, a week or so ago, Wizards announced that they were creating a pauper uh, panel, I think they call mm-hmm. it, which is uh, a group of people including like people from the community that are well-known pauper players, uh, as well as Gavin Verhey, uh, who were going to be kind of like the commander rules committee, sort of, but uh, yeah, sort of advising wizards on, on bannings for that. So we saw a few bannings in pauper, uh, mostly targeting at affinity from, from what I understand. We saw ATOG and uh, a couple of artifacts get, uh, get banned. So that came out, but when they sort of announced that, they did preview that there was going to be another announcement coming yesterday or, or the day before, whenever it actually came out. So we, we knew this banning was coming, and a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about it on the podcast that uh, they would said they were going to do some rebalancing for Alchemy once the set championship had been played, which was on this past weekend. So plenty of notice that this was coming, uh, but don't know if we were expecting all the cards to be on here that are on here. So, do you want to take us through it, Cracker? I sure do. So, starting with the banner restricting announcement, Standard. Apparently, there's a format called Standard. I don't know if you guys are aware. <laughs> uh, but Alrin's Epiphany that's that, has that been- That's that dead <laughs> format, isn't it? <laughs> that's- uh, Yeah, apparently. Alrin's Epiphany has been banned, Divide by Zero is banned, and Faceless Haven is banned. Uh, in Legacy, Ragavan the Nimble Pilferer is banned. In Historic, Memory Lapse is banned from Suspended, and Teferi Time Raveler has been rebalanced and unbanned. So, let's go with uh, Alrin's Epiphany. It's been the big boogeyman of the format for a while. Either of you guys surprised to see this one hit the chopping block here? I'm surprised it didn't (laughs) get a banning earlier, um, mainly because it pushes out... uh, Let me start again. The, they're applying a lesson learned from the previous set. So the last set came out and kind of did nothing, like because Alrin's Epiphany was better than anything in that set. So we saw zero new decks. Well, not zero, but you know, very very minor impact of a new set on the standard format because Alrin's Epiphany was just clearly the best thing that you could be doing. So I think they've gone. We've got a new set coming out in a couple of weeks. We want that set to make an impact. We want to sell packs. Uh, we want to see new things on Arena because uh, format churn is a better thing for player experience than just being time-walked 30 times every time you sit down to 
uh, play the game. So I think this is a, uh, yeah, an application of a learned lesson, albeit too late, I think, for a lot of people. But it is, uh, it, it's better late than never, right? So what do you, what do you think, Shorty? Uh, I'm, I was just totally shocked that there's actually bannings in standards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I thought, as I said before, I thought standard was just going to be the dead format where it's like, okay, you know, we, we can just let standard do its thing and, yes, there's cards in here that people don't like and whatever and they're either going to play the format or they're not, but alchemy's where our focus is going to be. And so when hey, shorty, we have- Hey, shorty, hey, shorty. Paper magic still exists. <laughs> how, how many people do you think or how often do you think standard tournaments fire in paper? Uh, I, I in would the think- US and, and Japan- and and places much bigger than than where we live, uh, I, whilst not at the scale that they used to, I can guarantee you that they're happening at, at a local level and and a you know potentially even yeah I, I don't larger. think there'd be many. I mean there, there uh, is there is no larger tournaments for for starters, but yeah I'd I'd be surprised if there's like you, you just sort of look at our local scenes. The, yeah, but we we the live formats- in Australia. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's still going to be the we've same got everywhere. Very, we've got, we live in Australia, but more importantly, we live in Victoria, where our restrictions are infinitely more tight than 90% of the rest of the world, who have been playing Paper Magic for months now, where it's a still such a novelty for us. So they're, they're happening, not in the numbers that they did pre-pandemic, 100%, but they're, they're happening. Yeah, we're seeing I, tournament I, there's, results there's definitely... And- there's definitely- tournaments being played i just think that the proportion of standard events compared to other formats is probably extremely small and yeah i i just i i assumed and obviously wrongly that they were just going to let standard be standard so that they didn't have this because as was sort of mentioned in our in our discord this week these standard bannings yes obviously it affects the cards on arena but it affects real life cards where that are worth money in paper sort of thing and so I was under the impression that they were just going to let standard go and not have to deal with people complaining that their expensive cards just got banned. Uh, and wizard, yeah, wizards don't I was, I was listen wrong. to people complaining ever. They never have. There's nothing in their history <laughs> is evidence that. Uh, but if they go, what they've done is they haven't replaced standard. They've gone, standard is a revenue stream. It's diminishing, yes, but it's still a revenue stream. If we introduce alchemy, new revenue stream, not do away with a revenue stream. They are adding revenue streams. That that they're a business and that's expansion. That's what they're doing. Uh, so they would never. And look, legacy kind of contradicts what I'm saying a little bit. But <laughs> uh, cards that sell current, sorry, sets formats that sell current sets. Uh, you know, they're, they're not going to not going to completely abandon standard because you know some revenue from standards better than none. So they're always going to still support it and. They're going to maybe ban a little more aggressively to keep it interesting, potentially for you know in-store players, and who knows if we've got you know Brad, we've got Brad Nelson involved in stuff now, so maybe we'll see Huey. you know more of a push. Yep, Huey. Yes, he's Cracker. involved. Huey, 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 Huey. Huey's involved. Yeah. It's Huey. Yeah. So I, I think Nelson. it's yeah. the, the the two one one birds that are the real problem with Aaron's epiphany. Um, yeah. So, Divide by Zero is another card that got banned, trying to get us back on the 10-minute <laughs> tangent. tangent about standard That's just what we thought of the bannings. I told no, you the bannings. Oh, my goodness. You didn't talk about the bannings at all. Anyway, uh, Divide by Zero. Uh, it's, it's the closest thing we've seen to remand, I guess, in in modern era magic, where, you know, you're, you're effectively just time walking is, is another term that you get used. And, and, you know, the value of drawing a card is pretty huge. So, I'm- I think people really hated playing against this because like I having enjoyed it's playing not even, it's it not, a lot. Yeah, yeah, correct. It's fun to play, right? It's it's that sort of no. Look, you can have another try next turn, and I'm just going to get a card that I want, and then you know maybe I've got another one. I guess we'll find out next turn. Like if doing that, you know, it's a huge tempo swing. So yeah. it's situationally better than remand. Or it, look, it's more expensive, so you would expect something more for it but you don't only draw a card you draw a card that you want but you've only got so many of those cards in your yeah, sideboard correct and sometimes remand draws you the land that you need so it's different but yeah i, I think the uh, remand allegory is pretty close there uh, and it was a bit of a miserable card 
when paired with Alron's Epiphany because it was kind of like a mini time walk, right? On the yeah. way to setting up your big time walks. So, yeah. Yep. So, so uh, I think it's good. Faceless Haven. Do we think that this is just the, well, we hit the, the big spells decks, we better make sure that the aggro decks are not just going to crush everything now? Yeah, that's pretty much what they said in their, in their article. Plus, Book of Exalted Deeds is miserable. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so like they said, they're, they're taking a Faceless Haven to weaken the, the two aggressive archetypes without yep. fundamentally changing them. So I don't think it's a huge loss for those decks because they've, we've got mono-coloured, creature lands already in standard so you just get rid of your the snow lair of the hydra and, den of the bugbear yeah and uh, whatever yeah, the white yeah. one is uh, the bugbear, but yeah. the frost fang like the, the only Ooh, thing good. that it, you might still see like the green decks playing a snow mana base because they're playing like Briz- blizzard brawl mm-hmm. uh, and the uh, what's the two two that untaps a snow land yep something that one. the druid yeah <laughs> Yes, that's a so, safe bet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty good, a pretty good color. It's a mana creature. It costs two. Uh, it's an elf yeah. or a druid. It's probably both. Yep, yep. So yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. That, you may see green decks still playing snowlands, and yeah, just swapping out for faceless haven for for four um whatever that land's called. Man, I'm Lair of the Hydra. Yeah, that's the one. I'm not doing well with card names tonight. Well, like divide by zero was an, an interesting one. Like, like obviously, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts this week, so. Uh, although we're, we're kind of fairly early on the, the take because a lot of people record their podcasts earlier on in the week. But, uh, that seems to be looking at Twitter and that, uh, the one that people are sort of scratching their head about a little bit. Obviously it's good and, and he's powerful, but I don't, I don't see it as too powerful. The thing that where it becomes a bit of an issue, like they're taking it out of, you know, the, the decks that are playing Aaron's Epiphany, that sort of thing, and your, your Leer decks and your Hellbreaker Horrors and, and those sorts of decks where, like you said, it's almost like a mini time walk to get you to your end game. The problem is, is that it, it's also one of the only answers to Hellbreaker Horror because Hellbreaker Horror can't, <laughs> excuse me, can't be counted. And then once Leer is in play, you still can't counter your spells. But in both those circumstances, the divide by zero still worked. So you're taking away one of their tools, but you're also taking away one of the best answers for those two uh, really strong and powerful cards. So I wouldn't be surprised what you're doing, to see... What they're doing is they're taking away the most important card in the mirror uh, yeah. and and re- removing the top end. So It kind of yeah. just comes down to who hits their land drops and plays their Leer first. And which is, <laughs> which is win, honestly... Cool. Yeah, but that's old school control deck mirror matches so it's getting more back to that magic fundamental so whether that's successful or not let's see but i reckon that's what they're going for whether they say that or not where they want to get back to you know quote unquote real magic but um yeah it's it's going to completely change uh the the face of standard and and you know we're talking about decks that you know play divide by zero and our runs epiphany both of which are banned we're talking about how those decks play now and the mirror match but do they even exist after this like is there a leer deck that's actually viable without Auron's epiphany yeah. maybe something that we saw yeah, mason Edis play in a league finals uh where it was more like a grixis spells deck that that just played leave for value rather than as part of you know your lock piece um potentially i i, I don't know so it's a it's it's a change it's a forced change and you know um it it's going to drive some sort of innovation for three days. So that's great, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so Ragavan Ra- banned Ragavan. in Legacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't played a single game of Legacy since Ragavan got um, got printed, but uh, it or, seems or like... Or for quite a while before then. <laughs> or quite a while before then. Uh, but yeah, it seems like this was... Um, being called for quite a lot by the legacy community and, and people aren't too worried about that. It's not going to impact the price too much. If you've splashed out on Ragavan to your modern deck, your investment's still going to be fine because the, you know, 12 people that play legacy, um, you know, adding their play sets of Ragavans to the, to the market isn't going to, you know, make your Ragavans aren't going to do a Bitcoin on you. You're, you're, you're fine. So I think this is just a good change. No problem with that at all. Yeah, I, th- I think Ragavan had become like the the blue red Delver decks 
were not really Delver decks anymore. They were Ragavan decks with like one or two Delvers, and yeah, it was just sort of. Well, they're, they're Dragon Rage the Channeler format. decks as well, is the other thing. Yeah, the, yeah, Delver Ragavan is like the third decks. best Delver now. Yep, yep, yeah, and and I, I guess sort of the thing in Legacy is you've got, and they mentioned this in the article, you've got Force of Will and Days to protect your Ragavan. So it, in the same way that you used to. Play a Delva, flip it on turn two, and then just protect it for the rest of the game to win. Well, now you had Rag- Ragavan that was doing the same thing, and it- and Ragavan just generates so much more value than Delva ever did because the the two damage from a Ragavan as opposed to the three from a Delva really doesn't matter in in Legacy when you're just controlling the game. So yeah, I, th- I think people are pretty keen to or glad to see that that's gone. Surprisingly. I guess surprisingly to me, I, I thought maybe it was going to go to uh, go in modern, but maybe we're in that uh, little bit too close to when Ragavan was printed. We can't ban it in Legacy and Modern all in one go and destroy everyone's collections. Uh, well, but I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised no, to see it go at some point. No bans in modern for this, so yeah, they're, yeah. they're obviously somewhat happy with the you know the diversity of the format. And the thing is, well, I think we discussed this on a previous cast recently. They'll ban things around it before they ban the marquee cards from the yeah. current expensive set, right? So if Ragavan is a problem with, I don't know, Spell Pierce, we're more likely to see Spell Pierce get banned than Ragavan to try to weaken the deck. But yeah, whatever it might be. Yep. So it's, um, you know, they want to keep selling the, the decks, selling the packs. And, you know, if the backside falls out of, people's investments from a a banding like that, then, you know, there'll be outrage, so. Yep. Uh, Memory lapse in Historic, I don't don't think anyone's surprised that that's staying banned in in a similar way what we were saying before with Divide by Zero and and Remand. Memory lapse was all way worse. worse. (laughs) (laughs) You can just draw that again next time. time-walking people. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so yeah, now we, we should get our uh, our wild cards for that, which will be rare. Actually, I think I'm getting like a dozen. Correct. It's four four from four mythics from Aaron's Epiphany, four mythics, uh, four rares from Faceless Haven, and should be four rares from Memory Lapse. So that's nice. what I need just before a new set. Good job. Yeah, I've only got like six rare wild cards, but yeah, like twenty two mythics or something. It's just yeah. Yeah. And your favourite planeswalker is back, Cracker. He's back. Let's talk about he, Teferi he just the got Time Raveler. Put on a little bit of weight and <laughs> he, he did. He just. He's time he, that he was he, gone. <laughs> he used to use Teferi's protection and now he's back again. So he's changes. been in lockdown for a long time and he's put on a whole extra mana. That's what's happened. Yes. He's, uh, he, yeah. So what have they done to him? They've made him cost four and they've upped his loyalty. His starting loyalty is now five instead of three, I think it was. No, starting loyalty was four. Ah, uh, it was right? four. Yep. Yeah. And his static ability says your opponents can't cast spells on your turn. So- Which is a lot better. It is so much better. Like, so much better. I still don't like the card, but I mean, there's just some <laughs> residual hate there, I think, more than anything. Uh, he doesn't fundamentally break the game. This this effect is something that we have seen many times before. You know, there, yep. there are a bunch of creatures, particularly in white, that have this effect- uh, you know, where you can uh, try to think of what is Grand Abolisher is one where, you know, like it's white, white for a 2-2 and opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities during your turn, right? Like it, it is a thing that exists. It doesn't break your own turn. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the thing to do, right? And I guess if it's still broken and super annoying, then they have the, the ability to make more adjustments. I like this change a lot. Uh, coming down on turn four... Versus turn three or turn six instead of turn five, if you're keeping mana up and, and things like that, is a huge difference uh, in a format like Historic, where you've got some pretty fast aggro and combo decks. And I don't know, Shorty, if you've ever cast a uh, a finale uh, trying to get your bin chickens back, <laughs> and they've got with a Teferi in play. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big feels bad moment. I've only done it once. I did learn my lesson, and but I was confused and I had my opponent like spamming the oops button at me and just made me <laughs> grumpy. So yeah, it's a uh, uh, it's, it's it's like oh that works that way. Yeah, that's kind of dumb that it does. But well, now that I think about it, my understanding of rules, yes, it does make sense. But yeah. it's unintuitive. No, no, it's it's still dumb. 
<laughs> it's the same with Gates dumb. bells. Yeah, yeah there's a, yeah, a bunch of things like that that shut off. But uh, I mean, so many times when it was in standard, it's like you know they cast a fairy on turn three, and it's like, oh yeah, that resolves. I'll just cast my opt at end of turn, and then you get it just skips straight to your turn, and you're like, why didn't I get to cast my opt? Oh, that's right. I allowed that to fairy to resolve before I tried to cast my opt. It was just so annoying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think yeah. the big difference here is that well, one of the big differences is also the fact that it costs four now. So if you were the Teferi player and on the play, your opponent goes, you know, land, you know, land go, land go, turn three, you play, well, they play a, t- a t- two drop, you play Teferi, you bounce it, you just set them back so far, and then you've got this planeswalker that is interacting in so many different ways. It just it, now the, you've got much more time, you know, you, to run out multiple creatures to actually pressure it. Which One extra mana is huge, ag- absolutely. It's, yeah. yeah, but it's it's that extra turn, right? So, you know, you, you, you've got the chance to play like a one drop and a three drop and that sort of stuff. So, you've got more uh, opportunities to interact meaningfully on the board, which was one of the, the things that just felt so bad about it. Because, you know, you then untap, play your two drop again, and then, you know, they've got removal spells or counter spells or whatever. And, and you know, that's fine. So, I like yeah. it. I'm not too sure on them increasing the loyalty to five. I reckon they should have left it at four. Agree. Just like the when it comes down, like a, a common play pattern was you played it, it came down, it, it it had four loyalty, it bounced your creature, so it went to one loyalty, and then you could kill it quite easily with something that that does one. You know, like Spikefield has it, that sort of thing. It was easy to sort of finish it off. Being on two is that just that little bit harder, and and yeah, like it, even that sort of play pattern now where it's you know, you play your one drop and you play a, a two or a three drop, something like that, and they bounce your biggest creature. If you're left with a one one, that one one now can't kill Teferi, which is a bit annoying. So, yeah, I, I would have liked it to, to stay at four, but I guess we'll see see how it plays out. Be interesting to get some insights onto the play testing regime that they have <laughs> around this. Is this the, the play test team? Is it play tested at all? Uh, you know, what is the, you know, what, I'd love to see their testing evidence <laughs> effectively. So yeah, I'd like to see that on a lot of different cards, I guess. But, yes. But, yeah. <laughs> like Ragavan. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, he's, yeah. He's fine. He's fine. Yeah. Yeah. He's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I've been, I've been getting some Ragavans on the field, uh, in the last week, which, uh, we may get to soon but with, uh, the original Ragavan coming from, uh, Kari Zev. Mm-hmm. So it's good. All right, uh, so along with all those bannings, which should make a fair bit of difference in, in their respective formats, they did their first round of alchemy rebalancing. And Cracker, you're going to read every single one of these 18 cards that have been changed and tell us the difference and tell us exactly what impact each individual card is going to make on Historic. Oh, or, sure or am alchemy. not. Nope. I think Shorty's <laughs> going to put all of that into the show notes. That's it. Uh, yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. We're going we're gonna to so- link the article. So they, what they did in summary is they reduced the mana value of a bunch of cards. They really pushed the dungeon mechanic in a bunch of other cards because turns out that that was, in fact, just unplayable anywhere outside of Limited and probably still is. Uh, yes. <laughs> and then there are a few cards that got... So those are the buffs. And then there are a few card adjustments that are actually worth getting into because I think these are the the ones that uh, are really well cards that saw play, and you know they, these are the adjustments that we're interested in. So these are the nerfs, but they haven't called them nerfs because I saw some interesting theories about why they couldn't call it nerf because Hasbro owns nerf as well, and they don't want <laughs> something. Yeah, there they don't want their brand con- associated convol- with. <laughs> correct, correct. There was some very convoluted. Uh. Th- logic and i went you know what it's just dumb enough to be true but anyway i mean uh, if they call them nerfs like the the common parlance or whatever is that that is a mm-hmm. bad thing and so then they're admitting that they're making Product things is worse exactly and then they are more likely to have to give out wild cards and whatever so if they make yep. adjustments then Correct. yeah we're in we're just, just re just uh rejigging and, the knobs yep yep exactly all right get all into right. it first adjustment divide by zero uh, only learns if it targets a spell with mana value four or less. So yep. if you bounce a seven drop, you don't get to learn, which is interesting. Uh, Fearsome Whelp. It now triggers on upkeep from end step and gains haste. So the, what is their logic here? They're trying it, to it make was it end easy of turn. to interact with. Yeah. Yeah. So like it, Fearsome Whelp was really powerful because you play it on turn two and then yep. straight away it reduces the cost of all your 
dragons, dragons. in your hand. And so Correct. if they don't if they don't deal with it like that before turn. you're in step, yes. that you're straight away getting all that value from it. And then if they can't deal with it the next turn, then all of a sudden your dragons are getting super cheap. So yeah, on your correct. upkeep, it gives it gives the opponent a chance to draw a card and answer it in their turn before you get that value. The haste, yeah. giving it haste, I'm not too sure about. I think no, that's still whatever. trying to keep it keep it pushed. But uh, that, yeah, it's, that's it's a model. A yeah, the the fearsome well uh, adjustment. I nearly said the, <laughs> the, the soft uh, pneumatic dart uh, gun <laughs> name. Um, it, that's a model that worked on the the white card that put plus one plus one counters on it. The whatever that was called, the, Luminarch um, Aspirant. Luminarch Ax- Aspirant. Yeah, triggering on upkeep rather than beginning combat step, and or end step or whenever it yeah. now. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, end, so, end step now for that one. Yeah, it still gets played. Still, still a good card, uh, but just you know, yeah, tweaks that knob just down, you know, down from a six to a five, and it's uh, it's still a powerful effect. And the thing with the it's the perpetuality of, of fearsome whelp. Uh, you know, we saw the uh, there was a cycle in a really really old set, the familiars, uh, where that was a black card that gave red and blue spells one cheaper, but it had to be in play. And if you killed it, you know, they went back to full price. So the arena only version here being perpetual, the balancing is it's a new space for them. So I'm not surprised to see them rebalance these new cards as such. So uh, because it's a brand new mechanic never seen before in Magic, the thing's being perpetually X. So it's a uh, – I'm not surprised. I think it's a fine change. I think the deck's still really viable, really playable, just slightly less powerful. Yeah, gives Sorcery yep. Speed Removal a chance to do its thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So the next card is Holebreaker Horror, and they removed this spell can't be counted. Sad. Yep. <laughs> It already does enough things. It really didn't need that anyway. It really it's got, didn't. It's got flash. <laughs> it does. It does. It has flash. Uh, yeah, yeah, the argument is with like Malevolent Hermit and Lear as well, then they just, you know, it, it, it did have too many lines of text. Yeah. That was actually the correct one to remove as well, I think, in, in terms yeah, of keep, balancing. Yeah, keep flash on it. and Yeah, keep yeah. flash. You know, it's it's a good control finisher, right? You actually need yep. to close. Yeah. The only, only other change I fair. could see them making on this is the return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand is changing that to target non-land permanent and opponent controls. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just to power it down a little bit because yep. that saves the bouncing itself thing. Yeah. Which is- uh, but I yeah, guess they'll, I'd they'll see how they go. And- I cast it a few times by, like, in response to you targeting my thing, I'm going to kill your thing and yeah, bounce my Yeah, and thing. bounce my dude. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so that's pretty good too. Same yep. um, the other one is a card that I have lost to, or well, the next one is a card that I've lost to quite a lot uh, when I'm playing against a white base deck, which is the Inquisitor Captain. They've added, if you cast it and it enters the battlefield. So uh, normally these things were super easy to chain together. Um, so this just you know, kind of dials it down a little bit. It's still a card advantage card in white, which we need, but I think they push this a bit too far and just people flooded the battlefield with three threes really quickly and with all the other comes into play triggers and things that the the white decks have, it kind of, you know, you, it's a, it was a, felt a bit like a one card combo at times. This kind of just steps it back to just being a good card advantage card, card in white. Um, yeah, just less... 3-3 three, three squadron hawky more just good white card yeah i think but. it's really important to make sure that white doesn't have good cards so <laughs> i'm glad that they've done this it's a priority yeah, yeah. correct yeah, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> uh we've mentioned Lear a couple of times um so they've just added during your turn to the flashback ability uh, yeah which is else which is makes sense which is a huge yep. deal because then yeah. you know like fading hopes and, and things like that like it's pretty gross to just be chaining instant out of your graveyard on your opponent's turn. Yep. Someone yeah, who thinks powerful. that that sounds like an awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate that it's pretty disgusting to get to keep doing. So, A card I didn't know existed for a little while is Town Raiser Tyrant in, on the list. And I really? mostly just like mm. killed it and ignored it, ignored the ability and killed my opponent whilst playing Phoenix. Um, you know, if you just go, oh, yeah, I'll take two from my land, but I'll unholy hit your Tyrant and bring back a bin chicken and just attack you and win. Like, it's never really been a problem for that matchup particularly, or maybe I've gotten lucky, I, I don't know. But, yeah, it, it, there's a red-green land destruction deck that 
that gets around and this is part of it. I guess this is still a playable card because red green land destruction decks still need, you know, some way to win the game, but it is a bit of a juxtaposition where it's like, I want to blow up all your lands except that one. <laughs> Right, so it's. I, a, I think this saw uh, more play in alchemy than in historic, though. And so, the, yeah, the, I've, the I've thing with this was the thing with this was with furnace whelp, you could or fearsome whelp. Sorry, you could go like fearsome whelp turn two, town raiser tyrant turn three, and then you've just got them under like a squeeze of well, do you want to take six every turn because you know you, otherwise you, you lose your land. So that's kind of where it came from. I think it was rather than. I don't think they cared about the, the historic element of it. It was just that it was very strong in alchemy. Yeah. I never played it in alchemy. Fair sure. to say, though, I haven't played a lot of alchemy. <laughs> but, yeah. Haven't played a game. Because <laughs> it's terrible. <clears throat> <clears throat> Anything it's- else on the rebalance list to nope. to talk to before we get on to the next uh, there's topic? One, there's one we missed, Sanguine Brushstroke, which is the, uh, the one that creates the blood artist. Oh, and that's then right. You- Sack a blood token. It was you. Your opponents lose a life and you gain a life. So now they've just changed it to uh, each opponent loses one life. Uh, I think that card is quite powerful because it it's like three mana and it's putting three permanents on the battlefield because you get this, which is an enchantment. You get a blood token, which is an artifact, and you get a blood artist, which is a creature. So three permanents for three mana is genuinely fairly powerful for anything that's going to care about having a lot of permanents on the battlefield. And yeah, we've got a few other effects like Metook Massacre that, that have sort of the lose a life, gain a life type uh, draining scenario. So I think they just wanted to power it down just a little bit. But yeah, I, th- I think that's quite a, a strong card in uh, in Alchemy as well. So, yeah, plenty of changes there, uh, a few sort of tweaks that are likely going to make a big difference. One card that mentioned before the podcast was Key to the Archive, which didn't have any sort of change. I think a lot of people were expecting that. That card is quite powerful. Uh, People winning through time warps because it's actually creating the card. You know, you can cast your time warp, which goes to your graveyard, and then you can bring it back from your graveyard, or you can cast it with flashback, like with Lear, from your graveyard, that sort of thing. So that's super powerful, as well as Approach of the Second Sun as an alternate win condition. So I I think quite a few people were sort of expecting something there so a bit surprising not to see anything at all with that card although i'm not really sure what i guess you could increase the cost of it or something along those lines but no you just change the spell book man yeah well that's kind of the thing like they've you they've just sort go, of tied oh, they've tied the card out. to the the mystical archive cards like that's what they are so if, as soon as you change them then it's i guess the, the card ones. isn't yeah. There's plenty of cards in the Mystical Yeah, there's, there's heaps of Mystical yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you mean Lightning know. Helix and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Lightning yeah. Bolt. Whew. Sorts uh, of clashes. It's still plenty of good cards. Yep. Memory so, Labs. Yeah. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Brainstorm. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Interestingly, they did say in the article that some of the iconic cards uh, from Magic's history wouldn't be rebalanced, even though they have the ability to do that. So, Brainstorm is not going to be readjusted to be I don't know what it would need to be, like two and a blue or one blue blue or something like that to be kind of fair. Draw, draw, draw two, put two back, or draw two, Brain put three back. strong breeze instead Eww. of storm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so they, they've just decided instead of trying to, to mess with it, they're just going to leave it banned. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. Anyway. Okay. Right. Anyway. So, yeah, we, we haven't really played Alchemy, so we can't really give you much of an opinion on that. Uh, I don't think we'll see the venture into the dungeon mechanic really taking off all of a sudden. It was one of the suggestions we made a couple of weeks ago was, you know, pick a pick a mechanic and try and buff it. So maybe they'll try and buff it even further. Who who knows? Uh, but I think Just get some your of influence those- out there, Cracker. Come on. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, look, yeah, I, look, I Cracker. said party. It was there was yeah, the one that close. was my cold shot. But it um D and D set. Yeah. Yeah. I tried. But yeah, I, th- I think the the ones that they've adjusted are likely to make a bit of a difference in alchemy, and yeah, we'll see if Teferi makes any sort of difference in historic. So, speaking of historic, let's jump into that. So, we thought we'd have a bit of a look at it, seeing as we have our one-day event coming up next weekend, and uh, yeah, in, if you haven't played historic, or you know, you're new to magic and you don't know what it is, we'll, we'll give you a quick rundown of what the format is, and then we're going to have a bit of a look at the metagame. So I might just quickly sort of run through the notes that we've got here. So Historic uh, historic started as 
what do we do on Arena when cards rotate out of standard? And uh, it was like, oh, well, here's this format called Historic that's just your cards that have rotated out of standard as well as the, the current cards in standard. And, and we all, when it first Great came idea. out, we all just went, yeah, cool, none of us are going to play it because it's just a boring format of old standard cards. And it's so far removed from that now <laughs> that it, it is its own format. So very quickly we started to see sets being printed directly into Historic. So we saw uh, uh, Historic Anthologies and then we saw Jumpstart and uh, Jumpstart Historic Horizons and, and all sorts Mystical of things. Mystical Archive. Yep, all that, all that sort of stuff going directly into Historic, which made it very much its own format, but also took it away from being a format where you play your old standard cards. Uh, not many decks cross over really from standard into Historic these days. Most of the powerful cards in Historic are the extra ones that they printed. So, no, I don't know if it's uh, achieving its uh, its original goal there, but it's probably making Wizards a lot of money because people have to spend wild cards to get all these cards that they uh, they print. So, yeah, it basically includes every card that's been printed onto Arena with a banned and technically a suspension list, but uh, now there's there's no cards on the suspension list. The, the only one that was on there was... Uh, Memory Relics. Relics. That one, yep. Just, just Which complete just blanked. Yep. Yeah, exactly. He just put that <laughs> idea just, back at the top yeah. of his library, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of a bunch of cards banned, all the, all the usual ones that you would expect, you know, your Oko, your Nexus, Omnath, Once Upon a Time, all, all that sort of the super powerful cards that we've seen go through standard, as well as a bunch of cards that came on the Mystical Archives that were sort of banned right from uh, right from day dot. So we you know we don't have Lightning Bolt and we don't have uh, Swords to Plowshares and, and things like that. So. Uh, the big thing with Historic at the moment that we're starting to see a little bit of impact on is that Historic has the Alchemy rebalanced cards in it. So it obviously gets the Alchemy printed cards, the cards that are directly going into that format, but it also has the changes. So the cha- changes that we just looked at for uh, the cards in Alchemy, they also apply to the cards in Historic, which has had its share of controversy that uh, we probably don't really need to go into. But it is quite a big format. There's around 26-ish uh, releases that have happened for it. So you've got a whole bunch of standard sets over the past, what, four or five years that we've had Arena mm-hmm. going for. Then you've got like your Kaladesh remastered and Armor Kit remastered and then all, all the supplemental sets, that sort of thing. So 26 sets is, is pretty big. I think w- when we looked at Pioneer last week, that was what, like 30-something, 30 38? So right. Pioneer's, Pioneer's a bit bigger, but... Historic's probably been a bit more uh, curated in what's being printed into it, whereas Pioneer is very much just the cards that have come come from standard. So because of that, it kind of has that feel of being powerful like modern, but not quite to the modern level. So it sort of fits somewhere between Pioneer and modern for uh, for power level. But it does also have a bunch of cards that aren't legal in modern that are legal in historic cards like Faithless Looting, as, as an example, which is banned in modern, is legal uh, in historic. So interesting format. I've been playing a bit of it over the last couple of weeks and, and quite enjoying it, and I think uh, you have too, Chewy. So do you want to uh, sort of take us through what's in the metagame for, for historic, and then we can have a look at a few decks? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, apologies if you can hear the thunderstorm outside my yeah, room right just now. Got that but- too. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's yeah, really diverse as as Shorty said, and I mean just running through some some of the decks that you know you see really well represented uh, or with good win rates. Uh, there are lots of different uh, archetypes represented. Uh, there's there's Phoenix, which I know Shorty and and myself more recently have been having a lot of fun with. There's uh, the the sacrifice decks, either the Golgari food or just the uh, Jund or Rakdos sack. There's the Scurry Oak Heliod combo, uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist decks. Uh, there's the there's the creativity decks. The Bant comes into playability or as affinity. Uh, Goblins, which was once the you know the king of of the format. It still Good old exists. Muxus. Good old Muxus, yep. There's Gruel and Mono Red uh, with the aggressive strategies. Rogues from Standard just got a better mana base and until this week had memory lapse. Uh, so definitely was very, very powerful. Um, 
elves, there's the Mizzix Mastery decks, there's Dragonstone combo decks, there's all sorts of stuff. It's super diverse. Uh, it, it's really, really fun. Uh, I've only had one time jamming it on, a, on Arena through uh, the last couple of weeks where it's like, oh, I feel like I've played this against this deck a lot today. Everything else has just been, you know, a different deck every every matchup, and it's that's really fun. And, you know, it makes you, you know, have to approach deck building from a different angle when you have that diverse metagame. And sometimes you have to go, well, I'm going to just try and do my thing because I can't cover every angle. And, uh, that adds a, a bit of, um, a bit of drama to your matches as well, where it's like, well, if they've got it, they've got it. If they don't, I win. And you, you've just got to kind of throw caution to the wind. And I, I've enjoyed that aspect of the, the gameplay. Uh, it's been been good fun. What about you, Shorty? You've been playing it a lot through the events and streaming a bit the last few weeks. Yeah, I've jumped How- on and done done a couple of streams with. Uh, I did a stream with uh, Phoenix uh, the first time, and and yeah, did did quite well with that. And then yeah, just this week, once my PC decided to behave itself, I jammed a bit of mono red. But yeah, I've I've found the same thing. It's been very diverse. I mean, I'm <laughs> I think both of us have been playing quite low in the uh, the ladder ranks. Me especially, uh, seeing as I've been playing the events as well, not not actually ranking up on ladder. So I might be seeing a a more diverse meta than is actually the case sort of up up higher in the ladder come on man i'm platinum one i'm right up there (laughs) i'm I'm still bronze three (laughs) Ah, okay i am Uh, yeah but yeah very very cool and and we've said it before that the format like feels a lot like modern where you can pick a deck and and kind of play whatever you want and have have some fun with it find uh, something that suits you so cracker have you had a chance to play much of it uh not for a little while but i've been paying attention to what's going on so yeah, it's, it look. It seems like, like you said, you can do everything. the The biggest downside to the format is just that there's quite the barrier to entry, right? And I yep. think that's just it's the the only thing that sort of stops people from going into it more. But it's just yeah, it's cool. I like it. All right. Well, give us a rundown a deck that you like the look of. So one that I think just got a little bit better, even though it was quite good, is Rakdos Arcanist. Which is playing with uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist is kind of the, the namesake card, uh, which is from a few sets ago. But it's a one through a trample, and when it attacks, you get a trigger, and you can cast an instant or sorcery with mana value equal to or less than its power. Previously, with Teferi in play, nope, you couldn't do that because Teferi. So because uh, <laughs> he's a jerk. Because <laughs> he's, he's a jerk. Correct. So, uh, this is a, it's, it's a control deck, right? It's playing Croxa, it's playing, uh, like Inquisition and Thought Seize, Go Blank. So it's, it's a Rakdos mid-range control, but pr- probably mid-range deck more than anything. And, you know, it's got some, just some powerful things, Magmatic Challenger, Challenger, Season Pyromancer for a bunch of card value. And then you can discard your spells into your graveyard and attack with your Dreadhorde Arcanist and cast them for free. Oh, the value. Um, yeah, it just seems like a lot of fun, a lot of lot of interaction, and just kind of you know trying to keep your opponent's hand under control while just applying some pretty good cheap threats and and just pressuring their life total with you know aggressively costed creatures. Any deck that plays Colligan's Command is okay. <laughs> Colligan's Command is a pretty great card. A very sure very good magic card. Yeah. Yeah, very Absolutely. low curve in this deck. Like, and and again, this Super is where it sort low. of looks looks like a modern deck. Like. All your creatures are two drops effectively, except for your season pyromancer, which is a three drop. And then we've got one. I don't even know what this card is. City stalker connoisseur. Apparently, this is an alchemy card that I've never seen before. Yeah, this card's quite good. I mean, a four mana three three that just you have to discard your most expensive spell, and you get a blood token just for just for value. Yep. Yeah. But then, like same in the spells, like you you've got mostly one mana spells, which is sort of what you want with the the dreadhorde arcanist. You want to be Correct. able to. Yeah get at least something off of it the first time it attacks with its uh, one one power and um yeah just a, just all the all the value spells that definitely makes it look like a modern deck so yeah very, yeah, very cool used to see used to see gruel lists that would play like pump spells to make yep. the arcanist bigger so you could cast higher mana value spells out of your graveyard and they're just worse <laughs> Like you just don't need to. Like it's no. it's one of those cards where you think, oh, if I can make it into a five five, and it'll be way better. And it's like well, actually, it's just 
gaining you so much value every turn that you don't need to try super hard and you're just wanting to play like fatal push and thought seize anyway because i mean they're just amazing you know on rate and do exactly what you want so yeah i I agree with that and this i think this deck has found a a really important niche and is a a really good uh what's the word i'm looking for it's it's kind of like the a balancer in the format so if aggressive decks get too much then you know the fatal pushes, flame bl- best flame bless bolts, inquisition of Kozilek, unholy heats, Colligan's command, just really deal really well with those those decks where it's not just a one to one trade because the Arcanist means that you're buying those back, you're getting more and more um, casts off them, and you're just controlling the board, controlling your opponent's hand. Eventually, you just play a Croxa and you win. Uh, and then against the control decks, you've got. Yeah, you've got all of your thought seizers and inquisitions and go blanks and then recurring those as well. And then you play a Croxa. So it, it's really, it's, really well set up and it's, it's really, really good fair vested. magic. Yeah. It yeah. It it's is. very much. It, so. it's, yeah. And yep. yeah, it's kind of the Jund deck, if you like. Yeah. You know, yep. In that, yeah, that traditional Jund, 50 traditional. Against everything. Yeah. Yep. It's also running like this list we're looking at has two go blank and one soul guide lantern in the main. So. Yeah, it's it's set up with a bunch of answers for creature decks, for Phoenix decks, for control decks. Like, yeah, uh, the main deck is quite well configured and then a whole bunch of one and two ofs in the sideboard so you can customise it that, uh, that little bit more for, for games two and three if you get to those. Yeah, not that absolutely. I, not that I know what those are. We, n- we never play those. People never play actually, those games. actually do that, surely, yes. Yeah. All right, Chewy, what's uh, a deck that you're keen on? Uh, so a keen that... Uh, a- a keen that I'm deck on. Um, no, <laughs> a, a deck that I'm keen on mainly because I, I keep losing to it is a uh, a creature combo deck. And you've said a couple of times, Shorty, that the format kind of feels like modern. This yes. kind of feels like a deck in modern. <laughs> sure uh, does. So, yeah, so it, it is the green-white uh, Heliod Company deck, which is uh, it's a creature-based combo deck. If you get yourself a, uh, a, a Soul Warden, into play and I've seen uh, some decks playing you know some copies of the innkeeper uh, as redundancy for that as well as the uh, Lunark veteran uh, from the Caltime set I believe no from Crimson Vale um, no. which is effectively a soul wooden uh, uh, you get that so every time a creature comes into play you gain a life and then you get scurry oak which is a three mana one two with evolve uh whenever a plus one counter is put on to scurry oak uh you create a one one squirrel you combine that with heliod sun crown whenever you gain life put a one one counter on target creature or enchantment you control so soul warden heliod scurry oak you go infinite life infinite one one creatures and you combine that with uh, selfless savior to keep your things around. Uh, you play Trellisara, uh, the green white two two that just gets bigger and scries every time you gain life. She is both a, a giant threat and uh, gives you that uh, you know helps you dig deeper into your deck into a green white deck that uh, you know wants to find specific pieces. But no card uh, in these colors does that better than collected company which finds you know all of your pieces and can just let you combo off out of nowhere so it's a uh, a really really powerful deck uh it's kind of cool it's creature based so it's quite easy to interact with but the you know collected company just lets it keep going even though you know you might play against a lot of fatal pushes and such you can still pull a win out of you can do it at instant with- speed Exactly. So, um, and every, every single green white player feels really smart when they leave four mana open on turn four and passes the turn. It's like, <laughs> what could they possibly have? Right. So it's a, uh, but yeah, the deck's really cool. It does, uh, it does a really, really powerful thing, but it does it fairly because it relies on creatures to do so. So yeah, I, I think that deck's, uh, really, really good. Uh, I, I like the sideboard. With, you know, Dromokus Command, it plays some Thalias. Uh, it can bring in, you know, Ajani's and Gideon's to just play a more uh, mid-range beatdown. Um, it's, yeah, Jams, Yashan, etc. Uh, it plays the usual mono-white 
or white based, uh, I was going to say company, but that's the wrong word, but kind of the right word, uh, of, uh, uh, interaction with, you know, Skyclave apparitions and voice of the blessed is also just a good payoff and it just becomes a giant beat stick. So, uh, there's a bit of play to the deck. It's not just about assembling your combo because if your opponent is doing things to stop you from assembling your combo, you can just keep gaining life and making your team bigger and bigger and just attack them and just play a, a fair but very powerful uh, aggressive strategy as well. So I, I think this deck's good uh, and a deck that, you know, if it's not your cup of tea, you're not looking to play a deck like this, you probably need to be prepared for it moving into our our historic event in a week and a half. Yes, pack your Rampaging Ferocidons and Roiling Vortexes and just make your opponents cry. Rampaging Ferocidon <laughs> uh, is, uh, yeah, it completely shuts this off. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Sure on, does. on many axes, actually. So, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, um, yeah so Bin Chickens, Shorty. Talk to me about Bin Chickens. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about bin chickens. I've spent way too much time talking about the the Phoenix decks, and it's it's not that different in uh, in historic from what we've seen. You do get faithless looting and and a few other little bits and pieces, but it's the same deck we've seen for ages. So we we, we don't really need to to talk about that. Uh, the deck that I do want to talk about though is another old favourite of mine, which is putting cats into ovens. I uh, I certainly enjoy that pastime, and. Uh, I, I have played, I think our last historic event, I think I actually played the Jund food uh, version with the, the Mayhem Devils, but it's kind of seems to be moving away from that a little bit now and playing more just the green-black because of uh, Meat Hook Massacre. So you now, between your, your cat doing the draining and the Meat Hook Massacre, you kind of don't really need the uh, the Mayhem Devil anymore. So you can, you can stick to just sort of straight green-black. You've got all the usual cats, geese... Uh, we, you picked up Ravenous Squirrel from the, uh, the Jumpstart Horizon set, which is quite good. It's a, a hybrid green or a black, so a, a one mana one one. And whenever you sack an artifact or a creature, you get to put a plus on plus on counter on it. So every time you're doing your loop with your cat, you're getting multiple plus on plus on counters because you're sacrificing the cat to the oven and then you're sacrificing the, uh, food to the cat to bring it back again. So there's two plus on plus on counters. Uh, and then it's got, uh, one black, green, a sack, an artifact or creature. You gain one life and draw a card. So that comes up quite a bit and it just gives you that uh, little bit of extra grinding by going, Oh, I don't need this goose anymore. I'll just sack that and, uh, gain a life, draw a card or I'll sack this food and gain a life, draw a card. You also get to put or a plus and plus on counter on it. So your yeah. plant token from Kalani Garden comes in handy yep. in that situation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. And then you've just got. You know, fatal pushes and village rights and deadly disputes and all those sorts of things that uh, let you sacrifice your creatures and uh, destroy your opponent's things or draw you cards and, and all that. Uh, your, your ovens and trail of crumbs. So, very cool deck. A million triggers and slow to play as as the cat oven decks always are. But again, they just grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. So, I uh, I certainly enjoy that deck despite not really liking mid range decks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Massacre seems stuff. like a huge improvement over Mayhem Devil. Yeah, like Mayhem Devil was so much. I mean, you can target things, but yes, uh, yeah, Mayhem I, I Devil guess that's you the can big shoot down you, your you can control stuff, the board, right? but yeah. it's yeah. just so much harder to deal with it. Like you just drop it on two so often, right? You just yeah, do it yeah, where you just you're get actually it on the not field. trying to sweep the board. You just play yep. it, and then you just start accumulating value. And this this deck just is value dot deck, man. There's so many ways to draw cards in this deck. Yeah, it's kind and of you can you can kind of win out of nowhere sometimes with it. You know, you've got a cat and a, a goose and a squirrel and and whatever, like you know, three or four creatures on the field, and you just go, oh, okay. Well, if I just like meat hook massacre for one and wipe my board, uh, you you know, take that last four points that I couldn't quite quite get there, and or it keeps you alive or, or whatever. So yeah, it's it's very versatile, a very versatile card, and it just fits perfectly in the plan that you're already doing. So, mm-hmm. uh, not surprised to see that that adopted there. But yeah, you, you do miss the ability to control the board, or uh, probably more ping down like planeswalkers and things like that that you had with the, the Mayhem Devil. But sure. the Meat Mascot still controls the board enough with with wiping it. So, 
There's not really a, you know, there's decks that play Planeswalkers, but there's not like a, you know, a Super Friends deck that's tier one or anything in the format that you're really too concerned about that yep. either. So, you know, if yeah, someone a couple, wants to tap there's a couple out of turn control. four to play Teferi, you just kill them. Yeah, it's a couple of control decks getting around, like Jeskai's and Azorius, that sort of thing, that, that do like to play that long, slow game. But, uh, yeah, the, the deck still still grinds pretty well. So, yeah, it's good. You guys want to mention a couple of other decks that you you like the look of? I think Cracker, you're uh, you're a bit keen on some Storm action. Dragon Storm, man. <laughs> do you, do you remember when Dragon Storm was like tier one deck in standard? Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I remember that. That was when Jen was playing a lot and she was just like beating people down. Yeah, I, remember I just remember her nationals. saying, "Yeah, I, I, I remember Jen sitting in the finals of an F and M, uh, and she was just you know played." A, you know, an Izamaru followed by whatever two drop and their opponents, you know, serum visioning and stuff. And Jen's getting a bit impatient because they're taking a really long turn. Jen's like, can you kill me? Cause you're dead next turn. Can you kill me? <laughs> and he's like, I don't think I can. So Jen's like, okay, game two. <laughs> She's just really impatient with the guy. So yeah, um, little lesson there for Jen. Be, be patient with a combo player every now and then, please. Uh, something she's learned over our marriage, which is good. Yes. So, yeah. All right, Craig, quickly, quickly run us through what, what on earth Dragon Storm is. It's a, a nine mana sorcery that says <laughs> search your library for a dragon card and put it into play. Then shuffle your library. Storm. So, when you play this spell, copy it for each other spell played before it this turn. Yeah. So, there's just a bunch what, of ways What dragons to- are we getting? Terror so, of the Peaks. Velma- yeah, Terror yeah. of the Peaks with multiple copies of Bladewing the Risen, and it just goes infinite. You get yeah, infinite right. numbers of Terror of the Peaks triggers with the two Bladewings, because yep. they both come into play, a legend rule, but then bring each other back. And you dump them into the graveyard with, you know, your cathartic reunions and all of the other ways to discard cards, faithless looting, and then you Mizzix Mastery or uh, back your uh, Emergent Ultimatum and then go and get uh, the cards that you need or you Unburial Rights, your Scholar of the Lost Trove, and it goes and, and does that for you as well. And... Uh, yeah, you just kind of combo people out. So it's it's kind of a reanimator deck. It's kind of a combo deck, uh, but it's mostly a combo deck, I think. Nice. Yeah. So, sounds like a bit of fun. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. I got a got a guy to one the other day. <laughs> Comboed off. <laughs> also plays Pactum Negation, which is pretty spicy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, you had another one you wanted to mention, Chewy? Yeah, another one just because I, I enjoy this as, as an archetype. I didn't, I haven't seen this since I've, been playing through Platinum, so that might tell you how good the deck actually is, but it's sweet. Uh, and it is a, uh, Selesnia Green White, uh, Enchantress deck. So, um, Destiny Spinner, Sanctum Weaver with Sithis, and, uh, you get the, uh, Enchantress's Presence as well, which was, is one of the cards from the, one of the sets that what are the, what are the jumpstart the, historic horizons? Jump start, yeah, one of those. Yep. Uh, and yeah, you just get a whole bunch of enchantments. Uh, you get Sterling Grove. So all your enchantments have shroud, but it's also a tutor. So you can go and get things like borrowed time and, uh, Gideon's intervention or rest in peace. Uh, it also plays nine lives solemnity. Uh, so it's a, yeah, draws a lot of cards, generates a lot of value, uh, can just, uh, sigil of the empty throne and make an army of five fives or it can just say you can never kill me now um, and go from there until eventually you create a army of four or five angels and kill them so uh, <laughs> you know I, the deck's cool I, I, I like it uh, I don't know how good it actually is but I just think it's cool that it exists yeah well yeah like we said super diverse format there's tons of different decks you know just jump on MTG Goldfish and you'll see uh, so many, so many different decks there, and like look at looking at their meta game. Is it Phoenix? Is only twelve point seven percent of the meta, which is stuff all. So uh, yeah, very very diverse. Pick something that you like and yeah, run with it. And uh, yeah, there's also a bunch of good budget options in in historic as well. So you can cut down on those wild cards that you're using. So Chewy, you're intending on playing the historic event. What's your deck for that? I'll probably play Phoenix because that's what I've been playing um, most of. But yep. I might spice it up a little bit, uh, but yeah, I, 
I guess the the Phoenix deck is my kind of my default, but I wouldn't mind playing something a bit fun. Yep. I think I would be playing Phoenix as well, which means we're just, you know, telling all of our uh our beans players that are going to be playing in the historic event to start packing all their sideboard hate. Uh, graveyard hate because uh, you've got probably at least two Phoenix players. Cracker, I don't know if you're any tending on playing, but if you are, what are you playing? Rogues. I love, oh, I know. Ugh. I love rogues. Oh, come on. I'm doing half your job for you. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, mill your- those yeah. bin chickens, man. I don't, yeah. I don't mind the rogues much. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, I, I love that deck. I had so much fun with it. So, yeah, I'd, I'd probably just do that. Probably because yeah, I've got enough. a lot of the pieces as well, so I wouldn't have to sink a million wild cards into it. It would be kind of, yeah, where I'd be at. Yep. Nice. Or mono red. <laughs> Just tall brand chain whirler. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I played mono red this week, and it was pretty much just a full creature deck except for four roiling vortex in the in the main. Everything else was creatures, which was a little bit odd for me with the, with the mono red deck, but... It was pretty powerful. It uh, did quite well. The Reckless Ringleader, the the Goblin, 1-1 Goblin with haste that perpetually gives a creature in your hand haste, very, very powerful when you can play that on turn one, give a Kari Zev in your hand haste, so then on turn two you're attacking with the 1-1, the Kari Zev and the Ragavan. Works quite well, so yeah, pretty powerful. And, and actually, surprisingly, which was a bit odd for a mono red deck, like the, the mono red decks have played in the past where you want to go quite wide and play Embercleave, you can get away with just having two or three creatures on the field and recover from board wipes fairly easily. You do have a lot of creatures that, that do have haste or uh, even menace. Menace comes up quite a lot, especially with like the, the Ferocidon as well. So, uh, and then you've got, yeah, all your other, you know, your mono red burn decks and your experimental frenzy decks and a whole bunch of different, different mono red decks. So. Plenty yeah, to choose from there if you're a red mage. Mono red, I'd probably want to do just live the dream of frenzy plus um, steamkin again. Yeah, and just yep. chain off. I think, yep, I think that was the most fun I had with mono red. Oh yeah, definitely. that was that was the best mono red deck that I've yep. ever played for sure. Um, I I'd be remiss if I didn't say hey, there's a affinity deck that exists <laughs> as well. So um, that that is definitely something that is is kind of fun. Um, Metal cyst is a, a pretty good replacement for cranial plating and, you know, plays all of the usual uh, blue-white uh, culprits, thought monitors, ornithopters. Uh, you got es- Esper Sentinel as well. Esper Sentinel, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, so uh, bringing in that sort of card draw hate bear element. Uh, also, uh, staff, the Black Staff of Waterdeep, uh, turning your Stone Coil Serpent into a base 4-4, then whacking a metal cyst on it. That, that's some beatdowns. That is some nice. beatdowns. So, yeah, I, uh, I I like I like the look of this deck as well. So that, that may be something that may be contemplated when thinking about what to sleeve up. <laughs> so we, we're gonna we're, we're gonna tell people that we're playing Phoenix, so they bring all their graveyard hate, and then we're not gonna play Phoenix. Gonna do the switcheroo. Sounds, sounds like that's a good it. plan. Got then him. I'm just gonna nettle system in the face. It's gonna be <laughs> bait and switch, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right, so yeah, uh, Historic's cool, a very cool format, but is expensive to get into just with your your wild cards. So try and find a, a budget option if you are a little bit tight on wild cards, and definitely come and sign up for our event. So it is next Saturday, the fifth of Feb, It'll be the first event in the Magic Beans tournament series for 2022. There'll be a bunch of invitational points up for grabs just by playing in it. You will be getting an invitational point, so you'll be uh, already on the on the leaderboard. And uh, looking like you're qualified for the Envy. So it might be your only time for the year that you can say, hey, I'm qualified for the Magic Beans Envy because I'm top 16 on the, the leaderboard or whatever. But if you're not playing it, you know, you miss out on those points. So get in on that. If you're not in on all that sort of stuff already, the best place to do that is to join us in our Discord. So that's where all the communication for the day will happen. You will need to be in our Discord if you're not there already. And, uh, yeah, we've got an awesome community there. So come and join us in there. And the uh, the link for that is in the show notes, as it always is. So the uh, other usual housekeeping things, we've got our merch store that uh, you can buy T-shirts and hoodies and, and those sorts of things from. So go and check that out. Go and uh, check out Josh and Pat's MTG Bazaar, jpmtgbazaar.com.au. Take you just straight to the Facebook auction group and you can check out their daily auctions and the Win It Now posts that uh, Pat puts up every night. 
You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. All of those places, just search for Magic Beans or Magic Beans Cast, and you'll find us there. If you want to find me on Twitter, I am at Peace Inc. Chewy, you are? At Chewy MTG. And Cracker? At Joel Hill underscore. Very good. So that's it for this week. Thank you, as always, for listening. Stay safe out there, and we will see you all next time. Bye.